But we started three weeks ago a series that we will be in 29 more weeks after today. And uh, we are going through the story. What the story is, it's the Bible put in chronological order and all of the extras taken out. When a story is told twice or three times like in the Gospels, you only get it once. This book is not set up. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, chapter 5, chapter 12, chapter 16, verses so and so. This is set up just like a regular book, a novel, a history book, all right? And it's got chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5, all the way to chapter 31. This is a chronological, continuous flow, so hopefully you and I can get the big picture of the Bible. Haven't you wondered how the Bible fits together? Has it ever been awkward for you in the past to know what happens when? So this is put together. It was done by Max Licato and Randy Frazee. And they put this together and did it in Texas. And uh, it's now being released across the country and we are doing it here. And so you can pick up a copy of the story at Majesty Christian Bookstore. I believe they're still $14.95. They're regularly $19.95. I'm going to attempt to maybe have a couple of dozen here next week. Some people asked that in the 8 o'clock service. We'll do our best. We did have them in December. We were able to sell them for $7. Uh, let me see yours, Jake, because I'm a little confusing. This is what they look like. You can get them like this. It's just leather bound. This was a gift at Christmas, but this is the one that you'll get for $14.95. And what we're asking everybody to do here at New Hope is read the chapter that we're going to be preaching on the following Sunday. So this last week, you all were to have read chapter 3 in the story. How many of you read chapter 3 in the story? Oh, you guys are awesome. I can't believe there's no, there's no cut down, all right? No, no, no loss from last week to this week. Thank you so much. Today we're preaching out of chapter 3. Wednesday night over in the Burbot building, we will have question and answer time about today's sermon and chapter 3 that you read last week. If you will email at Tim at newhopechurch.net a question or two that you have from this week's lesson and sermon, then we try to be prepared for those questions on a Wednesday night. When we finish the ones that are emailed to me, then we open it up for general discussion afterwards if we have any time. Gene said uh, he filled in this last week for me. You all did a great job. Uh, it's a full house over there, and you are welcome to come join us, get acquainted with others, and hopefully answer maybe some of the questions that you have had. i got to tell you, if you haven't figured it out already, how excited I've been over the last few weeks as we have been diving into this journey through this seamless story of the Bible called God's story. Some of you were capturing for the very first time how this thing called the scripture unfolds. I've been encouraged as I've had conversations with some of you, as I've received emails from many of you, and by the variety of people who have said, I'm going to take this journey for the next 31 weeks. I said to a guy at the 8 o'clock service, who was rarely at the 8 o'clock service, he's usually in this one or the later one, I said, man, you were up and out early. And he said, Tim, I got some things I have to get done today for work, but I made a commitment I was going to be here for 31 weeks in a row, so I came at 8 o'clock. Tim and Fawn Boss, I think I told you about their tragedy, they had a flood in their house, they went ahead and got dressed <laughs> without a shower this morning. Came to the 8 o'clock service and they'd go home and clean up afterwards. Just that kind of commitment to not want to miss anything in this seamless journey is very, very exciting. And it's taking place from our children's classrooms all the way up through our senior adults. For some of you, this is your first journey through the scriptures. And you are asking those basic introductory questions that are rocking your world, that rocked our world the first time many of us uh, went through it years ago. And then there are some of you who've been through the Bible year after year after year, but you're doing it again, and you're talking about the fresh look that you're getting at concepts that come from the Scriptures. You're not only curious about those concepts, but you're asking questions that say, how can I make these concepts work in my life? So it takes me to the next level of growth in my walk with Jesus Christ. I've enjoyed getting emails and listening to some of the families talk about how it's impacted their family time together. How many of you had a chance to read it together with your family in your home this week? Raise your hand. Oh, look at that. I've had some folks say, we've never ever done this in our house before. And 
boy, we don't know if we're giving the right answers to our kids because they're asking some tough ones. But it's, you know what? It's fun that you're doing it. The small group participation on Wednesday night. Exciting. I'm telling you here and now, the Word of God is something that all of us need every day of our life. And I'm encouraged by what you're doing as we go through this series. i got to tell you, I've been encouraged by the folks participating each Sunday. The two previous Sundays before today, and I think we're going to do it again today, we've had over 600 in our three worship services the last two Sundays in a row. And that is just absolutely incredible. You see, this kind of stuff is what floats my boat, lights my pilot, and it's the wind beneath my wings. Man. You guys are making me soar high these days. As we dive into chapter 3, that begins at page 29 in the Story Bible. If you do not have a Story Bible and you brought a regular Bible, this is found in Genesis chapter 39 uh, up to chapter 44 or 45, which is where we're going to be covering today. What that guy did, okay, on the screen in three minutes, I'm going to do in about 40 minutes today. <laughs> I'm just preparing you right now. I want to introduce you, and I want you to pay careful attention to something that all of us need to know about the Bible. Every one of us must catch this. It makes the difference in the way in which we study the Scriptures. It makes the difference in the way in which we live our lives. There are two perspectives in life that run parallel with each other. As we live in the physical world, and as we are engaged in a spiritual relationship with God, there are parallel tracks running simultaneously. A Bible college professor I had on the name of Jack Williams when I was in California Christian College said as you study the scriptures, you need to learn how to study it from not only earth's perspective where you live, but you need to study the scriptures from heaven's perspective where God designed it. You need to study it from both perspectives. Max Licato, in a book that he wrote not long after they did the story Bible, he explains it this way. He said there is an upper story and there is a lower story perspective to the scriptures, and they run parallel. The upper story is that one seamless story that we have been learning from the last few weeks, and we will continue to learn for the next 29 weeks as we journey chronologically through the Bible. The upper story is the big overall plan of God. It's the big vision that God has, where it begins, where it's going, and where it's going to end up. Ultimately, you can tell the upper story plan of God in 60 seconds or less. Put me on your timer, all right? You got an iPhone? Go to timer. Let's see if we can do it. Here is the upper story. It begins in Genesis 1 and 2. We see that God does creation. And God's big vision for the creation of the heavens and the earth ultimately is about you and me. He wants to extend the community of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, to include those that are created in His image. But in order to extend it, He has to create us. So the big vision of God is to be with us, to hang with His kids. In Genesis chapter 3, that's the fall. It begins with an apple. We chose a different vision that God had for us. Adam and Eve made that choice. And as a result, it has an impact on every single one of us. We have a sin nature at the conception of our life, and it causes us to be separated from God. The rest of the Bible is basically story after story of the extent that God is willing to go in order to bring us back into relationship with Him. And no story better describes this than the TiVo scripture. John 3, 16. Quote it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. That verse is the picture of the cross. And then we fast forward to the end of the Bible, the last two chapters, Revelation 21 and 22. That's where you find creation part two. God restores the vision, and he is with us forever in the new heaven and the new earth. Now, folks, that's basically the upper story, the big plan of God. Did I make it close to a minute? 90 seconds. 90 seconds. Okay, minute and a half. Pretty typical for me. And every story between Genesis 1-2 and Revelation 21 and 22 contributes to the upper story in some way. The upper story is God's will. And it will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's the upper story. 
But you see, there's also a lower story. That's happening parallel with the upper story. The lower story is the day-to-day -day stuff of our lives. Things that concern us in the here and now, that consume our lower world, like relationships, jobs, or the lack of, family, boyfriends, and girlfriends. And man, I never knew I had to worry about our daughter so much as I have since that commercial. I believe it's a, uh, I believe it's a, uh, not dish, but the other people. I believe it's a direct TV commercial where the girl gets in trouble at school, she gets kicked out, she hangs out with the wrong crowd, and then she ends up having a baby with a dog collar. Yeah, yeah. All right? That is a great commercial whoever came up with it. But now I'm worried every time Ashley leaves the house, all right, what's she going to bring back? Uh, that's lower level stuff, all right? It consumes our world, illness and tests, busy schedules, paying the bills, passing passing the magic days. The lower story includes things that happen to us by others and things that happen to us by our own choices. Lower story is things like weather, record snowstorms in Denver and Omaha, dry in Fresno and Clovis. It's things like Super Bowls and bathroom floodings. That's lower story stuff. We are consumed with the lower story very seldom do you and I go to God in prayer concerned with a passion about upper story things. We usually go to Him in prayer and we cry out in the realm of our lower story. That's where we make our request for God to get us out of the jam we're in. But in the teaching of Jesus, as the disciples came to Jesus one evening and said, Lord, teach us how to pray. Jesus teaches us it's appropriate not only to pray for lower story things, but he teaches us we should have some concerns about upper story things as well. For those of you who know it, Matthew chapter 6, and you don't need to turn there, but this is what Jesus taught them as he gave them an example of prayer. He said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth, where? As it is in heaven. <clears throat> Parallel tracks. We are to start our prayers in the upper story. It's saying basically, Lord, before I get to the other stuff, let me remind you that my heart's intent is to be focused on what you're trying to accomplish from above. But then Jesus lets us know it's appropriate to pray for the lower story. For the next line, give us this day our daily bread. Lower story stuff. Now here's what we know about the upper story and the lower story. First of all, God will always accomplish upper story. It's his promise that he's made to us. Nothing will ever divert that from happening. Even our screw-ups will not divert the upper story stuff from happening. Number two, God's word unveils the upper story while giving to us practical principles to live by on the lower story. The word of God, as we're going to see, has principles that helps us live the daily life of the here and now. But it also continues to give us an upper story perspective in the here and now. And number three, I want you to listen really carefully to this. Make sure you grab a hold of this. God somehow works with the actions and the events in the lower story to accomplish his upper story vision. He even uses our mistakes or the mistakes of others against us. He somehow uses all of that to still accomplish what he's seeking to do. And there is no story in the Bible that is better at illustrating this than chapter 3. Turn there, if you would, of the story, page 29. It tells of Joseph's journey from slavery to becoming deputy Pharaoh, from the barrenness of a well to a palace. As we saw in chapter 2 of the story, God decides that he's going to build a brand new nation so he can reveal himself through that nation and bring us back into a relationship with him. The development and survival of the new nation is critical. It will be central to God's will and central to the upper story because it is out of this nation that he's going to reveal the big idea, his big plan to get us back. So he can restore the vision that was lost in the fall in Genesis chapter 3. 
We call that new nation the chosen family. And if you are new here today and you want to get caught up on chapters 1 and chapter 2, you can go to the church's website. And it's there as an audio track. It's also there as a visual. So if you want to not just hear me <laughs> and you want to punish yourself, this is lower story stuff here. Now. If you want to see what I'm saying, you can go on the website and look, listen to chapters 1 and 2 and be all caught up with us by next week. If you have the Story Bible, you can turn like five pages in. I think it's about seven or eight. It's actually Roman numeral page 11. All right? And you can find the chronology of the story. All right? From how things began all the way to the end of the Bible. And at the beginning of each chapter, at the bottom of the page, you will notice the storyline that's covered in that chapter. But uh, we're going to fill it up on the screen here, I think. Uh, I, I think it's going to come up here on the screen. There we go. Uh, this is kind of the chronology of the chosen family. It begins with Abraham's birth in 2166 B.C. Then we move to Abraham going to Canaan in 2091 B.C. And then Sarah gives birth to Isaac in 2066 B.C. And just so you know we're not crazy, remember in B.C. the numbers run backwards. Okay? So they go from a big number to zero, and then A.D., we start at one, and we get to 2012, okay? Some of you are doing your birthdays like it's B.C., but that's okay. That's okay. Uh, then Abraham offers up Isaac, and we talked about that in detail last week in 2050 B.C. Then in 2006 B.C., Rebekah uh, gives birth to Jacob and to Esau. All right? And then in 1991 B.C., Abraham dies. And today, we've come to 1915 B.C., when Rachel, who is the wife of Jacob, gives birth to a boy named Joseph. And the story of Joseph begins in this topically organized Bible. On page 29, Joseph is just 17 when the story begins, and it begins like this. Now his brothers had gone to graze their father's flock near Shechem. And Israel, remember Jacob had his name changed to Israel, by God. How many of you remember to think about what your name might be? Remember our little exercise at the end of last week? All right, good. I was just asking, that was awesome. As you know, your brothers are grazing flocks near Shechem. Come, I'm going to send you to them. Very well, he replied. He had no idea that very well meant he was going to end up in a well. He had no idea what he said that, that was going to be his destiny. We read at that time that Joseph had ten older brothers, and those older brothers didn't like him very much. They did not like him for two reasons. Number one, Joseph was the baby boy, and he was the father's favorite of the family. And that kind of irritated him. Now, you would have thought that Jacob, Israel, would have learned some lessons from his own childhood about a parent showing favoritism. Remember, he was his mother's favorite. He was the baby of the family. He was his mother's favorite. And his mother helped him deceive his father. And so he got the birthright and the blessing that his older brother should have gotten. And that put the family at odds for many, many years. But Jacob didn't remember that lesson. And so he has a favorite and he shows favoritism. And so the rest of the brothers didn't like Joseph. Number two, the brothers didn't like Joseph much. Because Joseph had these dreams, he believed the dreams were from God, and Joseph's problem was, he told his brothers about the dreams. I don't know about you, but I have found out that when I dream, I'm better off not telling anybody what my dreams are, because they look at me like I'm a little nuts, okay? And his brothers did the same thing. You see, the baby brother had a dream, and he told it to his older brothers, and here's what the dream was. He said, I had a dream that all my older brothers one day were going to bow down and pay tribute to me. Let me ask you, how would you feel about your baby brother if he told you that you were going to bow down and worship him someday? Here's a more story application for all of us to learn right out of the chute. Kind of put your Bible note to self. If you have dreams like this, keep them to yourself. As a general rule, older siblings don't like that idea. So one day, Jacob, the dad, sends the youngest brother, Joseph, out into the field to fetch his older brothers who were tending the sheep. 
His older brother seized this opportunity to ditch their brother. I mean, literally. They were going to throw him in a well and let him die there. And they said, oh, no, we can't do that. And besides, we might make a little money because here comes a caravan of Ishmaelites. We learned about Ishmael last week, didn't we? Remember, Ishmael was the son of Abraham before Isaac was born. Many years had passed, and Sarah and Abraham had not had a child yet that God said they were going to have. And Sarah said, you know what? God's got a problem, so let me help God out. And she says to Abraham, hey, I've got this young handmaid. Why don't you sleep with her and have a baby, and we'll call it ours? Abraham didn't give one word of protest. <laughs> they had a baby. His name was Ishmael. God said, Abraham, because this is from your seed, I am going to bless him. He is not your child of promise. It is not through Ishmael that my chosen family is going to come. It will come from a child born to you and Sarah. And there will be no other explanation for this nation but that it was a handiwork of God. But I will, I will still bless the child of your foolishness. But there will always be problems between the descendants of Isaac and the descendants of Ishmael. Notice how quickly they cross paths. A caravan of Ishmaelites come by, and for 20 shekels, the brothers sell their baby brother to the Ishmaelites. Let me give you one quick example of inflation. The cost of betrayal in the Old Testament was 20 shekels. In the New Testament, the cost of betrayal was 30 pieces of silver. Trail became very expensive. Then the brothers said, what are we going to tell our father? So they take that coat of many colors, they tear it, they dip it into some animal blood, they go back and tell their dad, Joseph was mauled by a beast. How would you like to have brothers like this? <laughs> or sisters? <laughs> Brought to Egypt, Joseph ends up being sold into slavery to the highest bidder. If, if anybody had a right to have low self-esteem, it was Joseph. His brothers didn't want him. They sold him to Ishmaelites. Ishmaelites didn't want him. They sell him to a guy by the name of Potiphar. He keeps being given and given and given away. Nobody wants Rejection issues in Joseph's life. Remember, Joseph was in Canaan with his coat of many colors. He had been there with his family. Now keep in mind, the family does not own the land of Canaan yet. This is simply the land that one day God is going to give to the descendants of Abraham. But right now, they are in the land as nomads and shepherds and foreigners. But God is one day going to give it to them. So Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and now Joseph reside as foreigners in the land of Canaan. But Joseph has been sold into slavery in Egypt, ripped off by his brothers, abandoned by them. He finds himself as a boy at 17 years of age. 17. I have two sons. Both of them were 17 ones. I can imagine, I can't imagine what it would have been like if they had been kidnapped and sold into slavery in a foreign place. I can't even imagine. Now, open your flyleaf to your maps like you've done the last couple of weeks and you put some marks of special events where the Garden of Eden was, all right, right there at the Fertile Valley of the Tigris Euphrates where the ark landed up there above Assyria, all right? What I'd like to do is find Jerusalem, make a little triangle by Jerusalem and put a J in it. That stands for Joseph. And then take an arrow and go from Jerusalem over to Egypt. Just draw a line over in Egypt. And that'll tell you, uh, that's where Joseph went, from his home in Jerusalem all the way over and into Egypt. Now, on page 31 in the story, on page 31, hey, we're going to find that something just appears without notice. No preface, it just shows up. And it says on page 31, third paragraph, the Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered. Even though God allowed the brothers to abuse Joseph, he's now prospering. Even though the Ishmaelites sold him, he's now prospering. I want you to pay very careful attention to a pattern here. God allows this to happen to Joseph by his brothers. Lower story stuff. And now that Joseph is here at Potiphar's house, a slave, God chooses to bless him and prosper him for the purpose of upper story activity. Hang on to that thought. This has implications in the pattern of God's involvement in our lives today. God's sovereignty and man's free will both the work so that God's will will be accomplished. 
And God's going to do it, even if it's people doing stupid things like brothers selling brothers. God will still get the work done. With the availability of God, Joseph quickly rises to a place of responsibility and he's put in charge as manager of Potiphar's house. I mean, everything. He goes from being tossed in a cistern to the manager of one of the most powerful men in the country of Egypt. And then all of a sudden, there's another twist in the story. I mean, this happens fast in Joseph's life. Page 31 of the story, another bomb is dropped. All right, on page 31 of the story, you're going to find a line that says, Joseph was well-built and handsome. What a description of this guy. Kind of like, I'm going to look as soon as I finish the new P90X workout. Let <laughs> <laughs> me tell you the frustrating thing here is, Joseph didn't need a P90X workout. He was just naturally well-built and handsome. And I would never know this because those are not descriptive phrases used about me, but apparently that creates problems. When you are well-built and handsome, women just throw themselves at you. And that's what Potiphar's wife did to Joseph. The scripture says every day, not just once, not just once a week, but every day he was there. And then go to page 31 and it tells you what she said. She was not subtle about this. She grabbed him and said, come to bed with me. And every time, day after day after day, Joseph denied her. Joseph said no. His character came out in critical moments. I want you to notice a young man was able to do what an old man was not. Abraham, with one temptation, said yes. Maybe Abraham thought, at my age, I'll never get another chance. <laughs> I don't know. So, so, so Joseph, Joseph did. He had already seen. Joseph had already learned upper story, lower story. It was already at work in his life. And so one day, she grabs for him. He literally runs out of his coat. He leaves his coat behind. Jack Williams, my Bible college professor, said he left his coat, but he didn't leave his character behind. And then Potiphar's wife soiled his reputation. She told Potiphar, look, look, this man you brought into our house, look what he's tried to do to me. He tried to take me to bed, and here's the evidence. That same Bible college professor said, reputation is what other people think about you. Character is who God knows you to be. Joseph allowed his character to come out in this up and down adventure of life. That's the story of Joseph. But then again, out of the blue, while Joseph is in a dungeon in prison because of something he hadn't done, Della, are there people in prison who've never done anything? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and, and in this case, he hadn't. Just good character got him in prison. While Joseph was there, the scripture says, the Lord was with him, and he found favor and kindness in the eyes of God and in the prison warden. That's page 32, third paragraph of the story. Now at this moment in time, if I were Joseph, I would be thinking about my relationship with God. God, I appreciate the kindness you showed me, but could you do that a few days earlier? Really keep me out of a lot of trouble. But God allowed for an unjust attack on Joseph's integrity, and he allowed him to go to prison. And once again, Joseph gains favor in the prison, and as a prisoner, he's put in charge of the whole prison. As you continue reading, you see that one of the things God gave Joseph was the ability to interpret dreams. This is obviously not an ability Joseph had when he was just at home with his brothers. He had dreams, but he couldn't interpret them. You see, having dreams and interpreting them, two different things. Man, would I like to have Joseph around after some of the dreams I've had? Actually, maybe I'm better off not. But, but Joseph got this ability from God. In prison, in a dungeon, now for two years, and he gets a call from Pharaoh, the head honcho of Egypt. He gets a call because Pharaoh's been having a dream and it's bothering him and nobody can figure it out for him. Page 32 and page 33. Last sentence of page 32, top of page 33. The scripture says, so Pharaoh sent for Joseph. He was quickly brought from the dungeon and when he had shaved and changed his clothes, he came before Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream and no one can interpret it. But I've heard it said that you, when you hear my dream, will interpret it. Joseph replied to Pharaoh, I cannot do it, but God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. 
It might be, not be the desirous answer, but he will give them an answer that he desires. Isn't that cool? Joseph interprets the dream. He basically tells Pharaoh that there's going to be seven years of the bumper crop. And then he says it will be followed by seven years of famine. The ground will produce no food. I've told you rightly what God wants you to know. Genesis 41 tells us that Pharaoh believed in Joseph. This Hebrew prisoner decides to put, Pharaoh decides to put this Hebrew prisoner second in command of all of Egypt. And this happens for, for the next 14 year period. He becomes the governor. Now this is only possible by the handiwork of God and Joseph knows it. Joseph is now 30 years of age. He started at 17, he's now 30. He's put in charge of everything in Egypt except Pharaoh himself. The story unfolds exactly as he described it. At the end of the first seven years, when the seven years of famine began under Joseph's leadership in Egypt, the Egyptians are prepared for it, but nobody else is. This famine is not affecting the Egyptians, but it is affecting many of the other people and nations around. No one else was prepared for this, only Joseph and the Egyptians. Pause right here. Do you remember one of the promises given to Abraham in the Abrahamic covenant we talked about last week? Those who bless you, I will bless. Joseph has been blessed by Pharaoh, and now because of Joseph and what's taking place in Egypt, the rest of the surrounding world is going to be blessed, and the God of Joseph will get the credit for it all. Amazing. You see, what Joseph doesn't know is that his brothers are soon going to make a trip to Egypt. You see, this famine has impacted Jacob and all of Joseph's brothers. Jacob instructs his older sons to go to Egypt, get some food, so they will not die. They have no idea the surprise they're in for when they get to Egypt. <clears throat> Let me ask you, if you were Joseph and you saw your brothers coming, what plan would you devise for them? <laughs> they sold you and never looked back. We're told that when Joseph saw his brothers, and Joseph is now 39 years old, 22 years have passed since he was sold down the river and thrown under the bus. Now he has the power to do more than he could have ever hoped and imagined to get even with his brothers. Oh, baby, wouldn't Jerry Springer would have loved to have had this family on his program? I mean, you can see it coming, right? There wouldn't have been enough bouncers in the place, all huh? right? But the next few chapters of Genesis are the tenderest and most incredible stories you'll ever read in the Bible or anywhere else. The brothers don't recognize Joseph. Joseph recognizes them. They don't recognize him. Probably at least three reasons why they didn't. First of all, 22 years have passed since they last laid eyes on him. He's grown up. He's well built and handsome. He's changed. Second reason, they're not anticipating. They're not looking for him. They're not thinking he's anywhere around. They thought he was with the Israelites. And number three, Based upon my understanding of Egyptian men from the movie Moses and the Ten Commandments, those Egyptian men wore a lot of makeup, so they did not recognize Joseph. I encourage you to go back and read the story. There is so much richness in this encounter of what happens between the brothers. But what did Joseph do when the brothers showed up? He forgives them. He forgives them even before they ask. He forgives them, I think, even before they showed up. There are those writers of Old Testament history that say Joseph is a type, a symbol of the Messiah to come. And certainly there are shades. That's the upper story to the lower story. Joseph does what Jesus did. He forgives before it's ever answered. How is this possible? I suggest to you it's because Jesus captured the upper story and the bigger plan of God. And we'll read about that in just a few minutes. What Joseph's brothers did to him in the lower story was completely wrong. It had lifelong consequences of pain and guilt. But you will see in just a moment how that plays out to their benefit. Even though they screwed up, God still wanted to love on them. God still used their mistakes 
to accomplish his overall plan and big purpose from the upper story. You see, God is going to reveal himself and his plan through the nation of Israel, through the nation founded under Abraham. God will reveal himself in the most intense ways in the years to come when he takes on flesh and blood and becomes one of us through the offspring of Abraham. But in order for this to happen, in order for the promised Messiah to come, the Messiah will ultimately be the one who will provide the provision for us to have a way back to God if it's going to come through the promised nation of a chosen family, as God said, then this nation of Israel must survive. They have to stay alive for the word of God to be true. The famine would have killed them, but God made a provision. Joseph says to his brothers, what you intended for evil, God used for good. Now you would say, possibly like I would, if God wanted to preserve this family, why not just not have a famine? Why not just get rid of it all together? The, the answer to that question is that the famine had purposes other than just what God was doing for the Israelites. Remember, this is an important principle about life in the lower story. Life is not just about you. Life is not just about me. It's not even all about the Israelites. The famine... God used as part of his plan. Because why? Other nations were blessed because they blessed Joseph. It's kind of like a person get, getting married. Let's use this as an example. A person who's getting married says it's going to be an outdoor wedding. Dear God, I'm praying to you today in the lower story that it will be sunny for my wedding. So it comes to your wedding day. And it's pouring down rain. And you say, God, why are you so mean? I prayed. God, why didn't you let Shelly get sick? I prayed. We prayed for God to do something in the lower story, not realizing that if God answered our story for it to be sunny, for it to be dry on a wedding day, it would have tremendous effects on someone else who counted on the rain to save their crops and feed a whole lot more. So God used the family for multiple reasons. He uses the strategy to do a couple of things. And he works that strategy out in our lives in a dozen different ways. First off, the famine not only provides a way to save the nation, but number two, I think it's going to expose the weakness of the people of Israel to save themselves. Jacob and his ten sons were starving. They couldn't find food on their own. And number three, it reveals to other nations how the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Joseph have blessed them. It highlights once again, as we have already seen and will continue to see in this unfolding story, the power and the presence of the God who saved them and blessed them out of a pit, through slavery, from the evil clutches of a seducer, from prison, through a famine, all the way to the palace. Wow, what an adventure. Somewhere in this journey, Joseph captures the upper story. And he lives it in the lower story. And I have to tell you, very few I don't know about you, but I want to be one of those folks who gets to where Joseph was in his life. That I live my life in the parallel planes. And I would love for you to want to be one of those as well. Very few people ever capture the upper plan of God. And live in the reality of what that upper plan means in the lower story. This is what enabled Joseph to process all the junk of his brothers and to forgive them. Why the prison? Why the slavery? Why the lies? After my brother did this to me, then why did you let Potiphar's wife unjustly accuse me? I think Joseph looked at the upper story of God and began to capture what it meant when he was just a boy of 17. What it meant for his brothers to be bowing down to him. Which, by the way, the passage tells us that when his brothers came to him from Canaan, in order to pay homage to the governor of Egypt, not knowing it was their brother, they bowed down to him. The dream came true. And they didn't even know it. They missed it. <laughs> Those of you who've gone through seasons of life, of trials, hardships, I hope you've learned that the trials and the hardships are training grounds for God to grow us up. You see, one of two options are ours in hardships and trials. We either regress to a fetal position or we grow up. If we just see it from the lower story, it's the fetal position. If 
we begin to get the inside of God's upper story. We grow up. And you know what the scriptures would say about you and about me? We're spiritually well-built and handsome and beautiful. That's the description of us if we're growing up through the tough times of life. If we see the big picture, I think Joseph had a tremendous sense later on in his life that the hardships that he experienced were equipping him for an incredible experience. As this story unfolds, Joseph moves his family, his father, and all of his brothers to Egypt, and he gives them the fertile land of Goshen. Now, you and I don't think about Goshen being all that cool. <laughs> I drive by that RV park anytime I go south, and I wonder why people come to Goshen. I do not, but it goes in there was a pretty good place. And, and Jacob gives his land to his dad to live in for this period of time. 22 years of life unfolded. A hard and purposeful life to carry out the bigger plan of God. Full devotion to God is giving our lives fully in the service of the upper story. But this is not where the story ends, at least not Joseph's story. Years passed and his father Jacob, known as Israel, died with Joseph by his side. Listen to this next part. This is so sad. When Jacob dies, Joseph's ten older brothers are scared to death. They've been living for over 50 years with their brother. And they've been living in fear. They have thought the only reason that Joseph didn't kill them was because Jacob was still living. And now their father dies and they think, uh-oh, Joseph is going to get us now. All those years lived with tremendous guilt. While Joseph had already forgiven them, probably since age 17, he moved on in life because he saw the upper story at work, but his brothers could not forgive themselves, and they remained stuck in fear. Possibly sound like any of you today? <clears throat> Sound like any of you in your relationship with God? God forgave you at the cross. God forgave you in a church. God forgave you at your bedside so many years ago when you have never yet forgiven yourself. How sad. Those are the huge consequences of our actions. Even though God often uses them to accomplish His will. When Joseph catches wind of what they're thinking, now that Jacob is dead, he says to his brothers, don't be afraid. This is page 42 of the story. Don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Yes, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done. What's being done? The saving of many lives. People from all over Egypt are coming here in order for their lives to be saved. Joseph captured the upper story of God. The Bible tells us that Joseph went on to live to be 110 years old. 22 tough years of his life. Accomplishing the upper story of God. And now he's enjoying 73 years of living in the embrace of his family in the land of Goshen. The scriptures tell us that Joseph got to bounce his grandchild and his great-grandchild off his knee. Page 42. His son, his grandson, and his great-grandson. That's where kids belong, isn't it? On granddad's knee. That was true in 1900 B.C., just as it is in the 21st century. <laughs> now you have to follow the story to catch the significance of this. When Joseph was about to die, he told his family, Bury me here in Egypt, but when God gives us the land, he promised Abraham. Th this is not an easy thing, is it? Abraham has to wait 25 years to have the son God said he was going to have. And then God says, I'm going to give you a land to live in. And they've got to wait, Joseph, over 400 years before the land becomes theirs. But he said, when I die, you take my bones from here and you take them home to rest in the dwelling place of our people. Joseph saw the upper story and it made the lower story richer for him. It made all the junk that happened to him by his brothers and by Potiphar's wife and the lower story. It made it survival. Whatever junk happens to me in this life, Joseph said, this is not how it ends. Some of you need to hear that this morning. Some of you are right in the middle of a bunch of junk. Your life is a struggle. 
You even admit that a lot of the struggle is from your own mistakes. But there's also some stuff happening to you, like happened to Joseph, that was out of your control. A lot of things hitting you real hard, like illness, like abuse, bad timing, loss of job, loss of home, loss of spouse, loss of child. You find either yourself or somebody you know depressed, discouraged, and you don't know what to do. As a result of chapter 3, I'll tell you what to do. Do exactly what Joseph did. Capture the upper story of God and live in it. When our lives are going well, we love to go to the Bible and get practical principles to share with others about how they should live their life in the lower story. We love what the Bible provides for us, but I'm telling you, when life gets tough, it is the upper story that sustains us and gives us hope in the lower story. It's the upper story that tells us this is not how life ends for us if we have chosen to embrace the vision of God through Jesus Christ. There's a verse in the New Testament that captures the same teaching. Many of you know it. Quote it with me aloud if you do know it. Romans 8.28 And we know that all things work together for good to those who love Him and have been called according to His purpose. All things in the lower story work together for those who have an upper story perspective. God's purpose. No one can promise you that all the stuff you're in right now is going to get worked out. They can't promise that it will be gone tomorrow. They can't promise it will be gone next week. I don't have all the answers to why my mother ended up with a rare disease. I don't have the answers to why they can't figure out what's going wrong in Shelly's insides. We don't know that it will ever get better here. But we do know that if it doesn't change and if it doesn't get better here, God will carry us through with faith in Him. We can lean on Him and the community of fellowship He's put around us. That's a part of our job as Joseph's in this modern day. And we can promise this. Whatever our situation is in the lower story, this, folks, is not how it ends. I don't care how good it is, it'll be better. I don't care how bad it is, I promise you, it will be better. This is not the way our story ends. I don't know about you, but that ought to excite you. This is not the way the story is. I cannot say to you that God will bring about change in whatever you're dealing with in the lower story. I will promise you that if you trust Him, He will carry you through. I can promise you that whatever you're dealing in the lower story is, it is not how it ends. As sweet and as wonderful it was, in the northwest corner of Heinz Hospice Home, as my mother stepped from life eternity. As sad and as sweet as it was, that was not the ending of her life. That was the entrance to an ending far more grand than any of us can imagine. By the way, it's this attitude that got the American <coughs> slaves through life. Have you ever listened to the words of many of the spirituals that were written and were sung during the slave days of this country? Just one. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. Those people lived a crappy life at the lower story. They were born into it, they lived in it, and they died in it. But they leaned into the principle of the upper story of God. They sang about the upper story of God, about the city that God was forming for them. And it gave them hope. Full devotion to God involves abandoning our will for the will of God and trusting the upper story. Just like Joseph, God wants to use our lives to keep the wonderful eternal plan of God unfolding. And you and I don't always know what the sense of that is for us, but God wants us to throw our hat into the ring and say without reservation, God, I'm in. <clears throat> a couple of weeks ago, I asked you a question. Do you or no deal. And if you say, I'm in, like Joseph did, then you will be able to say, I am in the place of God, and he has me here, and he is saving lives. There's no better place to be. So let me ask you the question. Are you in God's story? I mean, in all the way, full devotion? <laughs> have, you, have you entered into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ today? In other words, are you really a Christian? Not, not a Newfoldian, not a Baptist, not a Presbyterian, not a Methodist, not a Catholic. 
do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Have you said, Lord Jesus, in order for me to be in, you must be in me. I invite you in. It doesn't happen just because you go to church. It doesn't happen just because you, you, you put some money in an offering. It doesn't happen just because you clean up your act. It happens when you invite him. If you're a Christian, if you love God, are you ready to align your life to God's purposes, not your own? If you are a Christian and it's not going well for you at the moment, things are not making sense in your lower story, will you get through this by abandoning your will to God's will? Remind yourself daily of God's upper story while enduring the lower story issues just like the American slaves did. Again, if you're not in yet, but you want to be in, would you invite him in while I pray a closing prayer? Just bow your head, close your eyes, join with me in the prayer. Don't even listen to me while I'm praying. If you talk to God out of your own heart and say, God, I'm in and you come with me. Dear God, we are consumed in life with the lower story. We often cry out to you, give us this day our daily bread. We are so desperate and there's so many things that happen down here. We don't always understand why you let us get sold into slavery. Why you let us get tossed into prison. Father, we heard and we saw the true story of one of your followers, Joseph, and we gained insight about the why while we were on our way. Father, we saw Joseph capture your bigger vision and it allowed him to soar in those difficult places. We pray that you will give us wings to soar in our difficult places. We declare to you today as your people that we want your vision for our lives. We want to live the lower story and the upper story truth. And that is, we pray, and you may join me if you like. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. <coughs> Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the glory, and the Amen. Would you stand with me as we offer just one closing word of prayer? Dear Father, I pray that as we leave here this morning, that we leave with the light that no darkness will follow along our path. I trust that we will love without fear and without bitterness in our hearts. I trust that your truth will slip from our lips without any falsehood in our minds. I pray that the peace of God be at the center of our lives. And may your presence, which can never ever be taken away from us, go with us as we live the lower story of our life. Jesus' name, we surrender all. Amen. 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 Guys, have a